Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with another uh, reading vlog and I'm not quite sure how much reading will actually get done in this vlog because uh, I am going on vacation. It's been almost two years since I went on a vacation. It's been over a year since I've stayed somewhere that was not my house. Uh, and so I am fully vaccinated now and I am ready to hit the beach. So I will be going to kind of the Moorhead City area of North Carolina, but I will be staying at Atlantic Beach. And so there is quite a bit to do around there. I'm really interested uh, to see a few things. It's near New Bern, which was an old capital of North Carolina and one of the oldest towns in North Carolina. Uh, it's also near Beaufort, which is a really beautiful place that has the house that Blackbeard stayed in. But for the most part, I am planning on just sitting on the beach, looking at the waves, and reading a whole bunch of books. I really need to see the ocean. I really need uh, that therapy. This is the longest amount of time in my life that I have not been to a beach and that I have not been near the sea. And it has really taken its toll on me, I think. We are a very... Um, sea beach based family. Uh, there are a lot of people in North Carolina because we have both the mountains and the ocean. Some people really prefer going to um, the mountains and they don't care a thing about the beach. I personally care nothing about the mountains. Uh, and so this has been really draining on me to not have seen the ocean in over a year. Uh, so I am really excited to go down there. But I thought that I would tell you before we leave, uh, we leave tomorrow morning, I thought I would tell you the books that I am planning on bringing. And of course the goal with this vacation is, as with all vacations, to relax. So I don't have any hard books here. I'm currently reading War and Peace. That is certainly not coming. Uh, Dante is not coming. In fact, no classic is coming with me except on my Kindle if I decide that I really need to read a classic and I doubt that will be the case. Uh, for the most part, I have, I think, fantasy, but there might be some historical fiction here. Uh, so let's just get right into it. So the first book that I will be bringing with me to the beach is Giles Christian's Lancelot. Giles Christian has been on my radar for a very long time because he has a fairly popular Viking historical fiction series. And I have never tried that. A lot of people have asked me uh, when I've done Viking book recommendations whether or not I've read his series and if I recommend them. Uh, so I am hopeful that I will really fall in love with his writing here because I have heard nothing but good things about his telling of the Arthurian myth. A lot of people say his writing is extremely beautiful. And I am very harsh on Arthurian myth retellings typically uh, because I like them done in a very particular way. Most books don't do it like that. And I'm also typically very harsh on portrayals of Lancelot because Lancelot is actually my favorite character in the Arthurian mythos. Um, I really love Lancelot and I love Guinevere, mostly because my name, Jennifer Jenny, comes from Guinevere. And so I feel like I have to support her. And so I base a lot of my opinion on an Arthurian retelling on whether or not I think they got Lancelot and Guinevere right. Uh, and this apparently is just going to focus on Lancelot as a character. I know he has another book just called Camelot, uh, so I'll be interested to see if that's actually a continuation of this or it's just another Arthurian legend retelling in the same world. Uh, so I am really excited about this one. I'm thinking about starting this early. I might start this tonight uh, before we leave tomorrow. <laughs> I'm also carrying my most anticipated release of the year, uh, which was Sister Song by Lucy Holland. I am so unbelievably excited for this, and I almost don't want to read it because I think my expectations are too high. This is apparently in the vein of Juliette Marillier, or Marillier, I'm never quite sure how to say her name, but Juliette Marillier is my favorite fantasy author, and so anything that is compared to her, I'm instantly intrigued by. I instantly really want to try, uh, and so this is one that is apparently a retelling of an old English ballad, uh, which I had never heard of, and I'm actually very shocked about this. Uh, so this is taking place in the time period between Rome leaving Britain 
and the Saxons coming in. And the Saxons are actually um, the aggressors here, but this is about three sisters, I believe. And I'm really intrigued by this. I also picked up House of Hollow, and this is one that I have been intrigued by for a long time, mostly because the cover is absolutely beautiful. I mean, that's easily easily the most stunning cover of the year in my opinion. Um, but this is about sisters who disappeared in Scotland, I believe, as children, and they went to some kind of fantasy land, I believe. I'm picturing something very fae-like uh, because when they returned, time had passed and they were extremely strange. Uh, so now time has really gone on. They're grown up and one of the sisters goes missing again. Uh, and so I have heard mixed things about this. I'm really hopeful for it. In fact, I kind of think it's on a bit of a five-star TBR prediction for me. I hope, I hope that by saying that, I'm not setting myself up for disappointment, uh, but this is one that I'm really excited about and will easily be done in a day, I think. I'm also carrying the We Hunt the Flame duology by Hafsa Faisal, so We Hunt the Flame and We Free the Stars. I have read We Hunt the Flame before and I was a bit disappointed by it, uh, but I really think that I must have been in a strange mood because everything about this book seems like it is something that I should really like, uh, that it's playing with tropes I really like, it's set in a world that really appeals to me. Uh, so I'm hopeful that by completing the duology and reading them back to back, uh, that I will really enjoy it more the second time around. And they're so beautiful. These are also the UK paperback editions and they're just stunning. Uh, we Free the Stars just came out earlier this year and I've not heard very much about it. Uh, I have heard quite a bit of positivity around We Hunt the Flame, but I've heard very little about how the duology wraps up. This probably seems like a lot to you that I'm carrying as many books as I am, but I promise you that what I do when I am at the beach is I get up early, I go out, I sit on the beach, I read, I eat some lunch, I go back out, I sit on the beach some more, and then I read. I go in, I have dinner, then I sit on the balcony, if I have a balcony, look at the ocean again, and continue to read. So I actually get through quite a few books when I'm on vacation, so I may not read all of these, and I may read them all and need more books. You never know. Uh, so that's what I am planning on carrying. I will check in with you probably tomorrow when we get there. Today we are in Beaufort. I don't know if you can hear me over the wind, so I might have to do a voiceover. But today we are in Beaufort, North Carolina, which is a really old little town here. I think it is the third oldest town in North Carolina. So I will show you around the town. Hopefully we can see some really interesting sights.
Okay, we're gonna see how long this lasts because I have some kind of tripod up here and I have absolutely no clue if it's gonna stay, if you can hear me like this. I'm out on the balcony. I thought it would be nice if you could see the ocean and me, but uh, you can't, I would be too dark. I see now we're listing. Uh, so this is just gonna be a very atmospheric <laughs> blog update. So I have finished a book today uh, and that was Lancelot by Giles Christian and I absolutely loved this. Major, major Bernard Cornwell vibes, but the first half of the book was much stronger than the second. I'll say that. Uh, I think that a lot of time was spent in Lancelot's childhood, thus everything that happened when Lancelot was an adult felt a little bit rushed to me, uh, and there was a lot that he changed about the typical Arthurian legend, but what he kept the same, he didn't give you much explanation for. So if you weren't familiar with the Arthurian legend, you were lost in some parts. While if you are familiar with the Arthurian legend, then you didn't like some of the changes he made, I would say. So I think there was some confusion in there. Uh, but this is the only book that I had finished in full. I'm now over halfway through House of Hollow, uh, which I brought from home. But today, uh, I did show you earlier that we went to Beaufort, which is a little ways north of here, maybe about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And it's one of the oldest towns in North Carolina. Uh, and so it's really beautiful. And they have a house that Blackbeard stayed in. I showed you that last. Um, so that's the oldest house in Beaufort. Now there is a town spelled exactly like Beaufort in South Carolina, but they call it Beaufort. We don't know why. <laughs> we don't know why uh, each of us says it differently. Uh, but the Beaufort up here was actually named for uh, somebody back in England who I believe was the Duke of Beaufort. But uh, I decided to get a book while I was there at the Maritime Museum. And I did post about this on Bookstagram, but I picked up a General History of Pirates by Daniel Defoe. First of all, Daniel Defoe's name intrigued me because I'm really into him. I really like him. I think he's going to become a favorite classic author. I feel like we're just going further and further to the side. I am so sorry about this. Uh, but I think that I'm really going to enjoy Daniel Defoe the more that I explore him. This is really huge. Uh, and it includes a lot of information on famous pirates like Blackbeard, uh, like Anne Bonny, Mary Reed, Captain Jack Rackham, who was with them, uh, and Bartholomew Roberts, Steed Bonnet, that type of thing. I used to be really, really into pirates. I think I've said this before, Pirates of the Caribbean is probably my second favorite movie, if not my favorite. It sometimes switches with Titanic. Uh, and that led me down a deep, dark obsession. Like, can you imagine being 10 years old? Just imagine it for a minute. Being 10 years old, and seeing Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl opening weekend. It was life-changing, it really truly was. Uh, and from then I never looked back. I'm still very much into pirates because I'm now into the Vikings and uh, what are Vikings if not pirates really. Uh, so this is, I think, a pretty comprehensive book that was written fairly close to the time that these men were living, I would say. So this is a really interesting primary source that I was pretty shocked to see and it's huge, it's massive, and they did give us bookmarks. I'll show them to you. There we go. But there is a bookstore here on the island where I'm staying, uh, and so I went in there this afternoon, and at first I thought I was gonna have some slim pickings in terms of current literature, and that remained true, but then I got to the classic section, and boy, daddy, did they have an incredible amount of classics in really great condition and I thought for a fairly good price. Uh, so half of the store you could get used books, half of the store was new books. Uh, and so these classics were actually all in the news section. And so I picked up Rob Roy by Sir Walter Scott. I really like Sir Walter Scott. Um, Ivanhoe is one of my favorite books of all time and a lot of people talk about Rob Roy in conjunction with that uh, and so I'm really excited to try this one and in fact this might be my next read I'm not sure but wait until you see these next two because I'm kind of torn on which of these I should read next. I got Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini and first of all let's just say that's a great name Raphael Sabatini. Captain Blood's pretty cool too but Raphael Sabatini that's just incredible. 
Uh, but a lot of people have recommended this to me over the years. A lot of you guys have said that this is a pirate book I will like. So this is a classic that is actually about pirates, about a man who uh, is tired of being oppressed by the law. Uh, and so he becomes a pirate, I believe, somewhere in the Spanish main. Uh, and it sounds really like a lot of fun. The artwork on the cover is just extraordinary. Last but not least, I got the iconic book to read at the beach. Uh, that's Moby Dick. I watched a video and I will link to it down below. I found um, Ask a Mortician in the past few weeks and I have been binging her videos. Uh, and she had an episode all about the real story that inspired Moby Dick. And it was absolutely horrifying. It really got me intrigued. I said I had no idea that Moby Dick was gonna touch on some of that stuff. Uh, so I decided to give in and pick up a copy of Moby Dick. I've seen it three times today, uh, so I thought it was a sign that I should probably get it. Uh, so I had a nice little classics haul while down here at the beach, uh, and that's probably all the book shopping that will be done. I think the rest of the days here, I will be spending sitting on the beach as I did yesterday. Uh, so hopefully I will get some more footage of the water and I will finish House Apollo likely tonight. Uh, but I have not yet decided whether or not I am going to try one of these classics next or stick with some of the other books that I decided to bring. Good morning. I look a fright, uh, but welcome to the beach. Am I right? I look windblown, uh, but it is Wednesday morning. I don't know if I said, but we arrived here on Sunday. So it's been a couple of days yesterday since we went out to Beaufort. We didn't get lucky. We didn't grab a chair. Uh, but today we have, and so I'm getting ready to go down and sit on the beach. But I just saw dolphins. I saw dolphins out in the distance uh, from the hotel room. So we're up far enough that I can kind of see out a way. I was going to try to catch them, but they're not really jumping. Um, they're just breaking the surface. But dolphins. I have a soft spot for dolphins because they used to be my favorite animal. And in fact, as a child, my dream uh, was to be a marine biologist. And that remained my dream for a long time until I figured out that you actually have to be into science to be a marine biologist, which I am not. Uh, so let's go down to the beach. I will hopefully get some footage of the waves. I did finish House of Hollow last night which was fine. I think the mystery was incredibly engaging. It was a real page turner, but I don't think I can say that I was really attached to the characters and that for me makes or breaks a book. Whether or not I like the characters determines how highly I will rate the book, if that makes sense. Uh, and so if I am attached to the characters, I'm a little bit more forgiving with plot stuff. I thought this was very tight plot wise but I didn't think that the characters were really all that well fleshed out, but it was under 300 pages. It was actually a very short book. Uh, and so I wonder if length had something to do with it, but I'm now reading We Hunt the Flame. Uh, so I'm hoping that I enjoy this more the second time around than I did the first. I'm already really enjoying it and I'm already really liking the characters. So I'm not quite sure what my issue with it was the first time, uh, but I will check in with you later.
the tripod that I'm not quite sure will stay standing. So we have only one full day left at the beach and that's tomorrow. Uh, I don't think I'm going to finish another book. Maybe I'll get lucky uh, because I went rogue and I started Moby Dick. Uh, I had seen Moby Dick around a few times when I decided to pick it up and I wondered if it was just a sign that I should probably read it while I'm here at the ocean. I mean, really, what better way to read Moby Dick than looking out the window at the ocean or sitting on the beach? And I have to say, I've always had a lot of negative connotations around Moby Dick. A lot of people who were forced to read Moby Dick in school really did not like it. I've often heard that it's very dry and that it's a very dense book with a lot of dry language. I think his writing is absolutely beautiful and I'm not quite sure why people are calling this dry. Now the story maybe is not going to get as many people. I have just hit around the 100 page mark. They have literally just left port. Straight up, I am loving this book. I don't think it's going to change. I love everything it is saying. Every bit of it is making an allusion to something about the sea or something about a boat. And so like they went to church one day he talked about the preacher being up on the pulpit uh, in one of these older churches where the pulpit is up really high. And he talked about, you know, the preacher essentially being the captain of this ship and that essentially mankind itself is on a ship moving from this life into the next one. And our prow should be guided by God or godliness. Uh, and it's just fascinating because that's only one instance of many where he has made general everyday things feel remarkably nautical, um, feel like they are taking place on a ship, feel like they are taking place at sea. And it's just, mm, it's just so beautifully written. Uh, so I'm so excited about this. Uh, I did pick this up because here in North Carolina, we do have a history of whaling. Uh, and so actually the whaling that happened off our coast a little bit was with right whales uh, and these whales were called right whales because they were the right whales uh, to kill. They're typically very slow, they're very big and they have a lot of blubber on them which was very important at the time. Uh, and so Moby Dick is actually a bit of a retelling of something that actually happened uh, that was a really really gruesome wreck uh the essex if you have ever heard of that and the air conditioner has just come on so i'm sorry if you suddenly can't hear me but anyways i'm just loving this i'm a little bit obsessed with it uh, i knew i kind of knew that i would likely enjoy moby dick more than most people do because i do like things set on ships and i know a lot of nautical terms uh, because i used to be really into pirates. I think I mentioned that earlier in this video. Uh, but when I did fall into my obsession with pirates, I learned everything about ships, uh, particularly ships from the 1600s to the 1800s. So a whaling ship is actually fairly familiar to me in terms of nautical terms. Uh, so I'm not really confused by that so far, but I do think that that's probably where some of the dense and dry language comes in. Uh, but I think he's also trying to write about whaling as an industry because at the time of writing Moby Dick that was going out of style completely and so he knew this was a way of life that was ending and he wanted to preserve it uh, in some way shape or form which I think is really admirable. Uh, I just really am really enjoying this and I think there is a lot of interesting conversation happening here around colonialism. I think we're gonna move from kind of man versus man and understanding things. We're gonna move from that into man versus nature and I'm really excited about that. But you should have seen some footage today where we went to the Pine Knoll Shores North Carolina Aquarium and we also went to Fort Macon. They're both on the island and I just love an aquarium. Uh, I really do truly just love an aquarium. Uh, and this is one of my favorite aquariums in North Carolina. I think probably Nags Head might actually be the one I would say is the nicest when you come to North Carolina and you want to go to an aquarium. Uh, I think I would say Nags Head, but I really have a soft spot for this one. And we saw bald eagles and that's just incredible to me. Uh, that's a real pleasure uh, to get to see something like a bald eagle. They are really massive, massive animals uh, that you don't really conceptualize as big until you see them. Uh, so we went to the aquarium and I really enjoyed that. Uh, and then we went to Fort Macon, uh, which is just 
a Civil War fort. It was actually built prior to the Civil War, uh, but it was really uh, instrumental in some kind of battle in the Civil War in 1862. I don't know near as much about the Civil War as I should, especially being from the South. Most historians do specialize in the Civil War because we have uh, quite a few sites here. Not really so much in North Carolina because North Carolina did not want to secede. Uh, and so we had our own kind of internal struggle here because we were kind of forced to secede once everybody around us did. Uh, and so that's really interesting. I actually think Fort Macon was occupied by the Union uh, during the Civil War, but it also helped us during World War II uh, because I didn't know this, the Nazis got really close to us here in North Carolina and they sunk 50 of our ships off the coast here. And so forts like Fort Macon came back into use uh, to kind of keep an eye out for U-boats and things like that. And there were blackouts all along the coast, which I also was not really aware of. Uh, I knew we kept a lookout for U-boats. I never knew that they got that close, which is really, really fascinating. Just to let you know, I kind of DNF'd We Hunt the Flame. I had such high hopes for this. It starts off so good. And then it like reaches a point where nothing is happening. It honestly feels like nothing happens throughout this book, but it's so interesting that you care very deeply about the characters, or I do anyway. I'm really invested in the characters, but it doesn't feel like much is going on. It doesn't feel like much moves forward, and maybe it does. Maybe in the end I just don't care about what the plot of the book is, which is that they kind of go on a quest to bring magic back to this world, but I really, really like the characters, and I think if you had dropped the characters into another plot, I would have been far more happy with this. Uh, so hopefully I'm just putting this down for a little while and I will return to it, uh, because I did get the second book thinking that I could binge that duology while I was down here, but alas, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. So we're home, vacation is over, sadly enough, so I thought I would wrap up the vlog here. Uh, I know I said I didn't think that I would finish another book, but I did actually read in its entirety uh, our last day at the beach, I read Sister Song by Lucy Holland, which I mentioned at the beginning of this video was my most anticipated release of the year. Uh, and actually now it is my most disappointing release this year. It's my most disappointing read of the year thus far. Uh, I gave this book two stars, uh, which I think is actually very generous in my heart. I kind of wanted to give it one, uh, but I do think it's really difficult for me to give one star to a book unless I feel like the book has no merit. I just feel like this book was not for me uh, because I really genuinely disliked every character in this. And like I talked about earlier, I think in this vlog, character makes or breaks a book for me. And it determines how I rate a book because like We Hunt the Flame, even though I wasn't really enamored with the plot and I kind of wanted to sit it down at one time, I still gave it three stars because I loved the characters, and I'll read the next book because I loved the characters. I hated everyone in Sister Song. There is an air of war over this that you know war is coming, you know the Saxons are coming, and I constantly kept thinking to myself, I wish they would come on and knock this whole entire kingdom into the sea because I hate everyone. And I don't necessarily think you were supposed to hate everyone. I think you were supposed to feel like these were real, well-rounded characters who just had flaws. But to me, everyone made incredibly stupid decisions and was then rewarded for them. Uh, there is one character who you do feel a great deal of sympathy for and who I do think uh, really was a likable character towards the end. That's one character among how many that you actually like. I fully recognize this is a personal thing for me. I had extremely high expectations for this. Everyone compares this to Juliet Marillier. It is not that. Uh, it is not Daughter of the Forest, and I can't believe people were making the comparison between the two. It is a retelling, uh, but I don't think her writing is very similar to Juliet Marillier's at all, and I just really was not attached to the characters. At least with Juliet Marillier, when things are not happening, when a book is slow, when there's no real plot happening, you are at least attached to the characters, in my experience. Here I was not. Here I just actively really 
disliked everyone. This was just a massive disappointment to me. And I know it was because I went into this thinking I was going to give it five stars. Uh, but I know a lot of other people have really loved it. So uh, I do recommend you take a chance on it if you want to. But do not go into it expecting Daughter of the Forest. In a way, reading that kind of soured my reading mood. But then I finished a book that in my heart I want to give five stars. Similarly to Sister Song, I wanted to give Sister Song one star and I just couldn't do it. Uh, I thought that there was at least some merit to it, so I gave it two stars. Um, this book I wanted to give five stars. In my heart it has five stars, but I couldn't on a technical level give it five, uh, and that is Moby Dick. This was an absolutely incredible read. It was so good, so beautifully written, so suspenseful, but where it is suspenseful is the last 50 pages. I'm going to spoil something for you about Moby Dick. You think this book is about a whale. It's not about Moby Dick, really. It's about whales as a whole, whales as a species. You learn quite a bit about whales through this book, and so I finally understood why people were calling this dry, because he goes off on tangents, chapters at a time, about whales, about different kinds of whales, about how you can tell the difference between certain types of whales, a sperm whale versus a right whale, um, why Moby Dick is white, and why that's really horrifying, why whiteness is really horrifying, which was actually one of the most intriguing passages I've read in classic literature in years. I mean, genuinely, it was very introspective. This book had a really interesting take on colonialism to me, and I don't know that it's something that Herman Melville actually intended, given some of the things that he said, but I thought this was very, very nuanced for the time in which it was written, and there's a lot to dig into here from that aspect. But at any rate, I did eventually discover why people called it dry because it would get into the plot and you're like, yes, great, uh, let's see Moby Dick, let's learn about Captain Ahab and all of that. Then he would say, okay, well, we mentioned that, but let me tell you about why whales' tails are horizontal and fishes' tails are vertical. I mean, you're thinking, okay, but you just interrupted in the middle of a really important scene for the plot. And then you learn, you accept it. <laughs> In my case, anyway, I accepted it. I said, get this. The plot of this book has nothing to do with Moby Dick, has nothing to do with Captain Ahab. To Herman Melville, this book is about whales. And once I accepted that, I just really, really enjoyed it for what it is. I said, the book is not even about Ishmael. Half the time, you don't think Ishmael is the narrator. Half the time, you know, it's Herman Melville speaking to you about whales, educating you on whales. But it's so great. I really like whales, so I enjoyed the tangents. And in fact, I might even say I enjoyed the tangents more than the actual story. Uh, but it's just so beautifully written. Like I said earlier, the first hundred pages when they are on land, he makes everything on land seem like something nautical, seem like something happening at sea. Every time he describes the whales. He makes them seem human. He refers to whales in human terms. He'll call whales gentlemen. I mean, the book is really smart. In that way, there is no wasted time because he gets across his point so brilliantly. The point is, men are monsters, you know. Men are just as much animals as whales. And whales are just as intelligent and just as worthy of respect as any man. And it's just a really beautiful, moving book. The last line is incredible. Uh, I just absolutely love this. In my heart, I really want to give it five stars. But the tangents, there are too many of them. There were too many of them even for me. Everything with Moby Dick takes a back seat to getting your education on whales. Uh, and if you like whales, I think you'll really like Moby Dick. If you have read any of these books, please let me know your thoughts on them down below, and I hope that you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.